According to the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which has been doing independent studies, despite concerns, there is no U.S. government agency monitoring the spread of low levels of radiation from Fukushima along the West Coast and around the Hawaiian Islands, even though levels are expected to rise over the coming years. Whether you agree with predictions that levels of radiation along the Pacific coast of North America will be too low to be of human health concern or to impact fisheries and marine life, we can all agree that radiation should be monitored. So the question is, why aren't we seeing monitoring? What do we know and what don't we know? Today we are joined by Dr. Jay Cullen, Associate Professor in the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences at the University of Victoria in BC, Canada. He's helped to develop analytical techniques to measure trace metals in natural waters. Hi, Jay. Welcome to the show. Hi, Rose. Nice to have you. Nice to be here. We're also joined by Ken Bissler, Senior Scientist in Marine Chemistry and Geochemistry at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Ken has been studying the behavior of radioactive isotopes in seawater and groundwater. He's collected and analyzed seawater from around the Fukushima Daiichi plant since the radioactive leaks began in 2011. Hi, Ken. Welcome to the show. Hi, I'm pleased to be here. Well, it's great to have you. Over the past few months, there have been so many articles and videos and blog posts about why we should be so worried about radiation. And then just in the last few weeks, the LA Times has a piece called West Coast Radiation from Fukushima Disaster Poses No Risk, according to experts. And the New York Times has a piece that says Fukushima radiation still poses no California risk. So, so Ken, where should we go for information that is credible? Uh that's a good question, and I'm hoping we're trying to provide that, some of that on our website, this our radioactiveocean.org website that we set up. Uh, basically, you know, you kind of see two sides of it. There's kind of an alarmist response because radioactivity can be very dangerous. It causes cancer, and we should be concerned at levels uh, that have been seen on land, say, in Japan, and initially after the accident. But then they get down to lower levels further away you get from the accident, the further three years later we get from the accident. And those, uh, while the risk is never zero with radioactivity, it can be quite low. So that's when we start making comparisons to dental x-rays of bananas and getting maybe some confusion and people concerned about it's not the same. But in fact, you can fill my home up with bananas and it can't give you cancer. It's potassium-40, it's indigenous to this planet, and it has no room in the conversation of E equals MC squared. And as a scientist, you know, there's an other side of this, which is, in other words, we had an accident in 2011, cesium iodine, actually, 131, was one of the primary concerns because of thyroid cancer. It's decayed. It has an eight-day half-life. So we start to be concerned about cesium because it has a 30-year half-life for the 137 isotope. And so by saying iodine-131 has a half-life of eight days is a lie because it's 80 days, but iodine-131 can't exist without iodine-129. That has a half-life of 15 million years, but these are times 10 all the time because you break down other radioactive isotopes. And by saying 137, uh, you should have said, and the problem with that, of course, not only because it lasts 30 years, but that's just its half-life. It's actually 300 years because it's times 10 and he should also say that that brings along with it 30 times more strontium, 90. 90 goes right into your bones, right into your muscles. And he should also say at the same time that the reactors don't want run on uranium plutonium. So why are we talking about iodine-131? And why don't we bring it into context? For every four, three made, there's an iodine-129 created, and they don't go away for 15 million years before they even start to lose any of their strength. See, and so all of Woods Hole uh, scientists are doing this. Every single one of them are out there. And so Woods Hole should be called the black hole. And that's what they do with all the information. It goes down the black hole, and they come out with the misdirection. And this is really devastating stuff that they're doing because there's so many of these representatives out there. And they go on to work for other institutions and get a lot of publicity. And w when what they're saying is not factually right, and is actually extraordinarily misleading. You can't have iodine-131 without iodine-129. There's three iodine-131s made, and then there's an iodine-129. So 40 million becquels of iodine-139 in kelp, a single bed of kelp, means 10 million of those are iodine-129. They're never going to go away. 
Now, Ken, in a previous lecture, had made this startling claim about cesium-137 will turn into potassium-40. This is a prediction from the Japanese of where the cesium would go if it was released here after the accident out for about a month. This is going to keep looping pretty quickly, but it'll stop here on April 30th and go back to March. And we were using information like this to decide where we would go in the uh, early June to sample these isotopes. The thing about this, uh, that potassium-40 uh, is here at about 12,000, the natural isotopes. So these are getting to points where they're not of direct health concern. When we were out there in June, we weren't concerned about our exposure, even though we were measuring that to be damn sure. So why would he equate cesium-137 with potassium-40 that was coming out of Fukushima? And potassium-40 is just indigenous, harmless background radiation that if you consume uh, potassium-40, you off-gas the same amount as potassium-40. It's like cruise control on your car or the thermostat in your house that is regulated on everything on this planet. So why did he equate cesium-137, by the way, has... 30 times more strontium-90 wherever there's cesium-137. And they don't travel separate. So let's listen to Ken for a moment. We're allowed in the U.S. about 7,000 becquerels in our drinking water. So is it too dangerous to get a bat or too dangerous to drink water or make a cup of tea? or Is this potassium-40 again that Woods Hole keeps injecting into the equation? Because, you know... If they would just take the potassium-40, which is normal background radiation, has nothing to do with these uh, E equals MC squared, it would be a hell of a lot less confusing. Because it was very confusing. You know, someone would take a sample and say, it's 10,000 here. Someone would say, no, it's zero. So we really had to use our oceanographic skills to understand what was going on. The only reason it's really confusing is because Ken puts background, normal background radiation to the equation. If you had... Uh, 7,000 Beckwell's disintegrations per second of cesium-137 that also has 30 times more strontium-90, and you drink a glass of water, uh, you wouldn't make a 911 call. It'd start melting your organs. And so he does that to confuse the people he's given lectures to, the Woods Hole. Um, is very worrisome now when we look at it and realize what's going on here. This institution has a website where they try to direct everybody to, and he's repeatedly plugging that. This will end up causing a lot of people not to understand the significance of what the Beckwolves mean. And this is on purpose. This is um, relentless. He's at it all the time. He doesn't stop. And he's fabricating. This is utter and complete fabrications. So why does Woods Hole inject indigenous normal background radiation that you would find in potatoes or when you're flying on planes or when you're out for a walk or that's indigenous to the ocean? Uranium-238, we weather rocks. That's quite common in seawater. Potassium-40 is the most abundant radioisotope. In is there a shortage of models out there, Ken? It's interesting that Ken never uses any other models and he sticks to his potassium-40 as part of the equation. So let's move on to Jay Cullen from the University of Victoria in British Columbia, Canada. It's um, measurements of, of fish that are commercially important um, here. Um, some of the, the most relevant measurements, I think, come from uh, an article that was published by, by Nick Fisher in which Ken uh, was a, was a co-author and talking about Pacific blue fin tuna. Now, the, the concentrations of Fukushima derived radionuclides um, and the, the focus there was largely on the cesium isotopes suggested that there is additional exposure to radiation to human consumers and those eating typical North American diets um, could expect exposures to, to increase but that uh, on the order of, of 500 fold more exposure to radiation from human consumers of bluefin tuna would be coming from the naturally occurring um, radionuclide polonium-210 um, that, that's, that's been in the ocean um, since there's, there's been an ocean, more or less. So he's talking about 
something that's indigenous to the ocean. You can take a bath in this all day, every day. It can't possibly hurt you. It's plutonium-210. It's insignificant. It has nothing to do with E equals mc square. So why is he talking about it? So it's a, mis a misdirection. So we're talking about plutonium-238, plutonium-239, plutonium-240, plutonium-241. And this got a half-life of 24,000 years, but it's extremely toxic because it went through a chain reaction. And so by him injecting that into the conversation and not mentioning the words 238, 240, 241 or anything like that, he's trying to lead everybody away. And so we got endless headlines of plutonium, 76 trillion Beckwell's plutonium 239, 23,000 times higher and a billion times higher than J. Willamito. You got the effects of plutonium on your lungs. Just a single hot particle, and the entire North America was saturated with that for many, many weeks straight. We have uh, UC Berkeley showed it was two to three hundred times. The government testing was less sensitive than what they were putting out, just like J, except he's billions of times less sensitive. We have uh, concerns over plutonium and uranium being deposited and reconcentrated far away. And because it's liberated from the ocean through convection, through evaporation, through rain, through fog, one only has to wonder who's really, you know, footing the bill for Jay. And think about Jay for a second, how he actually used to work for Woods Hole Institution and how he uh, does all of his research on isotopes. And that's where he gets all of his funds from the nuclear industry to help incorporate that in every aspect of your life even though it's not even supposed to be out of a sarcophagus and now what's really unusual about this is that Jay specializes in phytoplankton this is the very foundation of life in the ocean and if you took an isotope of plutonium 238 instead of 210 or plutonium 239 or plutonium 240 or 41 that will kill uh, an incredible amount in its lifetime, but just in a matter of moments, it can kill 75 to 100 million phytoplankton, say that's in the same size as a glass of water. And so that isotope never stops. And Jay should know that. Jay should know what kind of threat that is to the entire ocean. Yet he's talking about plutonium-210. And I could spend almost an entire week on just what he's saying and eviscerate everything that he says, every single word, every sentence. That's how much he lies, that's how much he makes it up, that's how much he mixes together indigenous, natural, insignificant background radiation that everything on the planet is acclimated to into an equation of E equals MC square. Means he doesn't deserve to have his certificates, he doesn't deserve to be a professor at the University of Victoria in British Columbia, ever. That guy is outright, outrageously misrepresenting and misdirecting people. And it has to stop. But below the surface, the ocean is actually brimming with microscopic plants called phytoplankton. If you were to take an empty Coke can and go scoop up some water from the shore, in the Coke can you would have between order 75 to 100 million phytoplankton in that Coke can. This invisible forest of phytoplankton is critical to life on Earth. Phytoplankton provide the base of the marine food web. They also help our planet breathe. It has to stop. We, they can't keep doing this to us. Woods Hole Oceanographic is piling out these people and putting them into places where they're getting all these interviews and he keeps saying the same lies about the normal background radiation and equating that with the radiation that's man-made and that's extraordinarily toxic. It's um, a breakdown of society when the people we trust, the people we put our fate into, are stabbing everyone in the back all the time. He stabs all of his students in the back every day by doing this. He stabs his parents, his family, his children, his brothers, his sisters. And so um, I think, again, it's about putting the risk in perspective, um, I think there are, personally, there are a lot of uh, other reasons not to eat um, bluefin tuna that I would put closer to the top of my list um, rather than um, Fukushima radio, radionuclides. Um, may be worse than thought. Uh, studies from last year indicate 
that radioactive water will contaminate the entire Pacific Ocean in just six years. Kim Minji reports. This graphic shows the gradual contamination of the Pacific Ocean due to leaks of radioactive water from the crippled Fukushima nuclear plant in Japan. The simulation, which was run by a German marine research institute, shows the entire Pacific waters being polluted by radioactive water in just six years.